Happy Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the Sunday when we uh, reflect on Jesus' triumphal entry. He walks into Jeru- or rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Uh, they're waving palm branches. That's because they used to wave palm branches to welcome home a king after he won a victory. So they were saying, you are king. Welcome. What they didn't know is he was a different kind of king. And so uh, that is the king we celebrate and we follow today. But that is not the story we're reflecting on today. We did that a couple weeks ago. Uh, We've been walking through Easter week for a month now. Um, And so I I hope that you'll lean in today as we focus in on some of the uh, pain that Jesus had to endure the day he was crucified. So let me say welcome to those of you who are watching on Church 307, to the guys over at the prison, our friends at the jail. We are so happy. If you have not already made plans to do so, my invitation is really lean in this week. Like, don't let Easter week just be another one-time attend church, uh, one-time event. Let Make Easter a week in which you decide, I'm going to spend a week focusing on Jesus. And so whatever services you choose to attend or whatever studies at home you decide to do or whatever prayer habits you get into, really lean in and draw close to God this week. Okay, we're going to talk about the Via Dolorosa. I got lectured multiple times after first service about how I say that. I know I'm not saying it right, but I can't roll my R's. I'm sorry. Um, But we're going to talk about the way of pain today. So here it is on location talking about that. I am right now in Old City, Jerusalem on the Via Dolorosa, the way of pain, the the path that Jesus would have walked on the way to his crucifixion and falling multiple times. Eventually, Simon was asked to carry the cross for him. So I'm going to read from uh, Matthew 27, starting starting in verse 26. It says, So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead tipped whip. They turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put in him in scarlet robe, a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. And they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! As they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put on him clothes again. Then they led him away to be crucified. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon who was from Cyrene, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And they went out to place to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. The soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with bitter gall, but when he had tasted it, he refused to drink it. After they nailed him to the cross, the soldier gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head announcing the charge against him. It read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Did anybody else see the cat jump out from behind that trash can and attack that guy? (laughs) I did not notice that until they put that video in there. That cat just, just attacked that guy. That was strange. Anyway, that was off topic. So that, that path, that, that road that we walked uh, when we went to Jerusalem is uh, probably not the exact path that Jesus walked, but he walked that path carrying the cross, or at least the beam of the cross, and he was being tortured all the way. The Bible tells us that the entire regiment beat Jesus until they were tired. The torture that Jesus endured on his way to the cross was tremendous. And it wasn't just the physical torture. It was also the spiritual torture of having to carry not only that beam on his back, but also the weight of your sin and my sin. The weight of all the sin of human history, all the guilt was put on his shoulders. And he carried it to the cross with us. We call this path of the Via Dolorosa, the way of pain is what that means. Jesus did something that day that none of us could imagine enduring. And in his humanity, he couldn't have done it, right? I mean, he he had to carry a spiritual weight that no human could carry. Yet he also felt the the experience of the pain 
in his humanity. So how did he do it? How did Jesus endure the cross? Why didn't he give up? You know, every one of us have felt it. We've all felt the desire to quit. When things get hard, when things aren't going right, whether you're a student or a parent or a teacher or a leader of any kind, at some point you said, I ju- it would just be easier to stop, to just, I'm not smart enough, no one will help me, I don't have enough money, I'm too shy, I'm too ugly. Maybe you want to quit your marriage because it's not going like you had hoped. You want to quit your job because you didn't get the promotion. We've all felt that desire at some point. It would just be easier to quit. Quitting is easy. Sometimes the consequences of quitting are not so easy. But to all of us watching Jesus carry this cross on the Via Dolorosa, we say, Jesus, don't quit. Don't give up. You need to do this. We need you to do this. And to anybody who's watching you in your pain as you are contemplating quitting something that you know God has called you to do, we all from the sidelines shout, don't quit. You can do it. You might have to work harder than others. You might have to fail more times than other people. You might have to be more disciplined. Maybe you read slower. You may not be as pretty or as wealthy. But we believe that God has given you everything you need to do, everything that God has called you to do. Everything he created you to do, he equipped you to accomplish it. This this season we're in now is a really good one, but there has been days in the past where I really wanted to quit this job. I'm not a good enough preacher. People keep getting mad at me. People keep leaving. I can't remember all your names. Do you know how hard that is? And I just think, man, just, there's got to be something easier, right? Darcy and I, for a long time, had a hard time getting pregnant. We did the IVF thing. If you ever tried one of those, that's horrible. That's expensive. We did four of them. All four failed. And we thought, well, this isn't going to work. Statistically, the chances of a fifth IVF being successful after four failed IVFs are near zero. But we felt like God was, asking, was telling us to do it again. Okay, God will follow. Aren't we glad we did? Because the fifth and sixth IVF worked. We have two boys. Now, I'm not recommending you do five IVFs. I don't recommend it. Chances are low. But if God has called you to it, he will will equip you for it. Do the best that you can with what God has given you and it will be enough. Because we're so tempted to focus on what we don't have, what we can't do. Hey honey, will you put gas in the car? What am I, a mechanic? No. No. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not equipped for that. You see it all through scripture, people making excuses, coming up with reasons why they can't do what they've been asked to do. God asks someone to do something and they say, but, but I'm not good enough or, but I'm not skilled enough. I I can't do it. God wanted Moses to go to Pharaoh and set his people free from Egypt to speak God's word to Pharaoh. And Moses says, But I can't, but I'm slow of speech. God asks Gideon to go to the Midianites. And Gideon says, but I'm the least in my entire family. God asks Jeremiah to be a prophet. What does Jeremiah say? But I'm too young. God asks Esther to deliver the people, his people. And she says, but I've not been called to the king. But I, but I, but I can't. Here's my excuse. God wants to make Abraham into a great nation. And Abraham says, but I'm too old. God asks Peter to cast his net on the other side of the boat. He says, but I've already tried. And in each of these stories, these but I excuses, those of us who are reading the story really want God to say, no, you can do it. 
Come on, just, come on, you can do it. You can do it. That's what we want. (laughs) But that's not what God says, is it? In none of these situations, none of these circumstances was God's response to their excuse, no, you can do it. In fact, what God did in all of these circumstances was he turned the focus away from you and onto him. He didn't say, you can do it. God turned the focus onto himself. I can do it. The city of Corinth in the first century was a thriving Roman city, a powerful city city. It was the York, York city of the world in the, in the first century. They had a saying in Corinth. They said, in Corinth, only the tough survive. Yet in this city, you've got this ragtag, ragamuffin bunch of nobodies, unskilled, uneducated people starting a movement that amazed everyone. They were called followers of the way. They started a Christian church in Corinth that changed the city and eventually changed Rome. And you would assume that the Apostle Paul, watching what the church in Corinth is doing, would write to them and praise them. Great job. You're doing great. Congratulations. But the Apostle Paul wrote, writes to this group that's doing something that seems impossible from the outside. And what does he say to the people in Corinth? He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. In fact, a lot of the people who started the church in Corinth were slaves. So then you assume he'd follow this up by saying, you're not that big of a deal. You're nothing special. So you assume what he's about to say. So I've lowered my standards. I've lowered my expectations. You're you're not that big of a deal. So I don't expect much from you. No, what does he say? He says, remember how weak you are? And he says, but God, not but I, not but we, Not but you, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Because when we make excuses based on our weaknesses, we're actually in a good place to begin to recognize what we actually need. We make excuses for why we can't do what God has called us to do, but it was never our strength that we should have been relying on anyway. We're tempted to say, but I, but I can't do it, but I'm not wise, but I'm not popular, to which Jesus would say, exactly. And the truth is, God is bigger than your butt. And I have waited really long to say that. I had to like take a whole detour in this sermon to fit that sentence in there. (laughs) Instead of saying, but I, Paul says, but God. And I believe that if we will change the way we think about what we are called to accomplish, it will change our lives. Then Paul says this, therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. That's his whole motivation. He doesn't want you to think that you did it in your own strength. I'm not good enough, but God is. And he will give the strength, give me the strength that I need. A psalmist says this, my health may fail and my spirit may grow weak. But God remains the strength of my heart. Joseph, who was sold into slavery, goes to Egypt, becomes powerful in Egypt. You know the story? What does Joseph say to his brothers? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. Jesus said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, everything is possible. 
How can I ever be good enough? How could I possibly handle this pain? How can I per pers persevere? How can I face these problems? You can't, but God can. The Apostle Paul says this, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Christians, we believe that God can do more through us than we could ever imagine doing ourselves. He gives us strength. It's grace. It's generosity. He gives it to us. So how did Jesus endure the cross? In his humanity, he couldn't. But God did. But I think it goes even beyond that. It's even more than looking to his heavenly father for strength. I think he also looked to us. I think he also saw us and the potential for helping us. His love for us while he was carrying that cross was so great that he was able to endure more than he would have otherwise. So the second question I want to ask of this passage is, why did Jesus endure the cross? What was his motivation? What, what kept him moving forward toward his own crucifixion? What did it accomplish? What could possibly be so important that God himself would have to die? Well, first of all, I think he did something that we don't talk about much. Jesus won a victory, not a physical victory, but a victory over the spiritual world. Paul writes, Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. See, in the Old Testament, we see this common partnership between humans and spirits. You see them building the Tower of Babel together. You see them interacting together in the, the, the Egypt battle. All throughout the Old Testament, you see this partnership of evil humans and evil spirits partnering together to fight against God and his people. But then something changes in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you see that the, the evil spirits aren't quite as powerful as they were before. Jesus took their power. The last thing that Jesus says as he's ascending to heaven is he says, all authority has been given. All, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth over spirits and over physical things. Jesus took authority over all evil spirits. Now, he did not kill them. They're still tempting. They're still prowling around, trying to do whatever they can. But Jesus defeated them. The decisive blow has been struck. And in that moment, he did not only defeat evil spirits, he also gave us a gift. He gave us the gift of resurrection. When we talk about the events of Easter week, we call these events the gospel or the gospel message. Gospel literally means good news or the good story. What's the good story? Jesus died and resurrected. And because he died and resurrected, you can do the same. You can resurrect as well. That is good news. But I think sometimes we fail to focus on this message because we're so focused on good advice. It's more about you got to do the right things. You got to act correctly. You got to remove the right sins from your life. You got you to do the right behaviors. That's all good advice. But it falls short of good news. There is a big difference between good advice and good news. Now, there's a lot of good advice in Scripture. But the events of Easter week, really the focus of all of Scripture and of all of history is the good news. We've tempted, we're tempted to turn the gospel into a list of rules. 
of do's and don'ts, which just totally neglects the good news. What's good news? Well, let me tell you what good advice is. Imagine there's a student in class and the teacher comes over to the student and says, hey, there's gonna be a test tomorrow. But I got good advice for you. If you study, if you read your textbook, and if you do your homework, you'll do fine on the test. You just gotta put in the work and you'll get a decent result. So the student goes home that night and he's received good advice. This is what most of us do with scripture. Hey, you should do this and you should do this and this passage says you should do this and you should stop doing this. This is how we focus our message for many Christians. But that's not good news. Here's good news. Good news is the day of the test comes and the student didn't study. And the student didn't read the text message or textbook. He probably read some text messages. The student didn't do his homework. He didn't study. And so the te teacher recognizes he's going to fail the test. And the teacher comes over and he takes the test to himself. And the teacher begins to fill in all of the answers and take the test for the student. And the student is baffled. That's not fair. But it's good news. That's real good news if you didn't study. And did the student deserve it? That's what I want to know. What did the student do to earn this? How, how was he so special? How was he so good? He wasn't good. In fact, he was bad. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. But the teacher was good. It wasn't about the student's goodness. It was all about the teacher's goodness. She knew all the answers. She, she knew everything necessary for this test. So she took the test for the student. That's good news. And that's the gospel message for all of us. That is the gift that is offered to all of us. In theological circles, we call this substitutionary atonement. It's a substitution. Who's, who's taken the test? Or in this case, who's taken the punishment? In religious circles, we don't like this idea. It's not super popular in, in religious circles. Now, in, in evangelical circles, it's... it's kind of the idea, but in most religion, the idea of substitutionary atonement is just counterproductive, right? Because if I'm just going to take the test for the student, then why would the student ever study? We don't like that. You're setting a bad example for the other students. Why would this student do anything good from here on out? You've just taught them they don't have to do anything. This is just bad stewardship as a teacher, right? That's what we assume because that's what's logical. It is logical for us to assume that if God is going to give me the free gift of grace, then I would just use the grace to do whatever I want with it. You're going to forgive me every time I sin? Well, why don't I just sin all I want to? Why don't, why don't I just go nuts with this stuff, right? If you're just going to forgive me, that's the logical conclusion. If you read the book of Romans, this is like the conversation that Paul the, Paul the Apostle is having all throughout it. He lays out the gospel message. He lays out the good news. Here's the good news. For all have sinned and fall short, fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life, he says. So he goes through and he outlines this too good to be true gospel in the beginning of Romans. And then he gets to Romans 6. And he says, now I understand what you're gonna, where, you, where you're going to go with this. You're going to think that grace should allow you to do whatever you want to do, right? He says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more his wonderful grace? Of course not. 
Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? After he shared the good news, he had to clarify that we should not react to the good news by just doing anything that we want to do. And why did he have to clarify that? Because when our flesh, in our humanity, when our flesh controls us, then we would naturally use grace that way. We would use it as an excuse. When we have a but I mentality, when it is all about me, it's all about my strength, I'm just reliant on myself, then we cannot become more like Christ. If my heart's desire is to do whatever I can to please myself, then I would use the gospel to satisfy my flesh. But if I have surrendered to God, if I am living with a renewed mind, when I have traded my but I mindset with a but God mindset, then something in me changes. My mind is renewed. Jesus then takes over the sanctification process. I believe that if I don't teach in such a way that it leads people to the Romans 6-1 reaction, that if people don't respond to my preaching with, but that doesn't sound fair, then I haven't actually preached the good news. If people's natural response to hearing the good news isn't that it doesn't sound fair, then we haven't preached the good news at all because the good news isn't fair. There's nothing fair about it. When humans hear about God's grace, it should sound too good to be true because it is. Our message has to be good news, not good advice. Now, we believe there's a good, lot of good advice in there, but that's not what motivates us. But here's the hard thing. Not all good news is easy news. Good news can actually be incredibly difficult. Good news could be, hey, you got the new job. That doesn't mean the job is going to e be easy. Good news could be, hey, you were accepted into college. That doesn't mean that college is going to come easy for you. When Jesus invites us into his family, he also tells us, you're going to face trials and tribulation. You're going to have pain. In this, world, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. Because I, but God, has overcome the world. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Give up your own life. Take up your cross and follow me. In other words, Jesus didn't die so that we could live in this world. Jesus died so that we could die in this world with the promise of resurrection. With the promise of of living into eternity. Because the good news actually requires a death. We all must die, every one of us. Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, if you die, if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And here he's inviting us to a pre-death death. death. Before your physical body dies, to give up your own way of thinking, to give up your own motivations, to give up your own ideas and surrender to his. Sacrifice your life and make him your Lord. The old self has to die so that the new self can live. And the good news is the new self is better. It's more satisfying. Can you imagine owning everything? Just imagine that with me. Kind of fun exercise. Imagine you own Apple and Google. You own like countries. You own the United States of America. 
Even better, you own the Kansas City Chiefs. You own it all. Jesus said, imagine that with me. It's kind of fun. But if you got it, it would actually be bad for you. He says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Imagine the Satan comes to you and offered you the whole world in exchange for your loyalty to Jesus. Just deny your faith in him and I'll give you everything. You're thinking, my relationship with Jesus or own everything. Admit it, that would be hard. This is the same temptation that the Satan gave to Jesus in the wilderness. But if you owned everything in the world, and then you showed up at the gates of heaven, and they said, why should you get to come in? You're like, name the price. I got it all. How much is it going to cost me? And they say, you can't afford it. All of your stuff, all of your good works, all of your strength, it's all filthy rags. It is all worthless. Because if you try to take the test yourself, you will fail. You can't study enough. You can't read enough. You can't try hard enough. Because the only person who can take the test and pass is Jesus Christ. And when Jesus goes to the cross, he is the only perfect spotless lamb who can be crucified and actually have it accomplish something. And he goes to that cross and he is murdered. He receives the punishment for your sins because you were destined to hell. Hell is the punishment you deserve. Yet because God's grace is not fair, he took the punishment for you. He died for you in your place. And he accomplished what you could never accomplish because he carried the cross. He was tortured and he was killed in your place. It's a gift. And it's a gift that is offered to every one of us. And if there is anyone here who has not received that gift, what are you waiting for? Don't put it off. Do it right now. Do it today. Don't wait. What good is it to gain the whole world and end up in hell? Paul says to the church in Corinth, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I've talked to a couple of you this week who are carrying pain that I can't imagine. And everything in you is wanting to give up, is wanting to quit, is wanting to run away. My invitation for you is to trade your but I reasoning for but God empowerment. You're not who you used to be. You are a new person. You are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. When you are weak, God is strong in you. His death and resurrection on the cross gave you the gift of new life. And God is with you. He will give you hope. He will give you peace. But you will have pain. 
persevere knowing that there is resurrection. He gave you eternal life that you could not give yourself and fully sacrifice to him. If you've not made a decision to follow Christ, if you have not received his free gift, there's a card in front of you that says, I've decided, would you fill that out for us? Let us know that you're ready to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't put it off. Do it today. And all through this week, begin to meditate on what it looks like to more fully become the person that he created you to be. Not the person you want to be, not your ideas, but his. Not your plans, but his. Because in that, he will give you what you need. God, I thank you that you in us are great. I pray that those who are experiencing pain will find hope to persevere in you. God, if there's anybody here today who has not received your grace in their life, that they would run to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.